in the first segment, we can kind of do the good, the bad, the ugly, not on the full season. Now, we'll certainly have a season review. We'll try to wait on T-Bob before we do that. You still have a bowl game. You've probably already heard as well. You're playing in the Cheez-It Citrus Bowl. That's right. The Citrus Bowl for the 97th time has switched their sponsor, but now they are the Cheez-It Citrus Bowl against Purdue, the Gordy Rush Bowl. And maybe we can get G down here to talk about, of course, Gordy played at Purdue and LSU. And if I'm not mistaken, the first time these two teams have ever met. So that's going to be your opponent down in Orlando, I believe, on January the 2nd. So we'll talk about that as well. But let's go ahead and get into the game itself. Georgia 50, LSU 30. And if you had 80 points on your bingo card, congratulations, because I did not. I thought, and I said it all week, hand raised, I was definitely wrong. I thought Georgia would try to slow this thing down. I thought the score would be more something like 28 to 10. Uh, maybe 24 to 10. I thought they'd try to take away LSU's dynamic offense because at times it can be dynamic. Now, certainly it's not been for the full season, but when they're going, they can score points. And you saw that in this matchup. A team in Georgia that only gives up 11 points per game gave up 30 points, and it could have been more. There was points left on the table. But if we're going to go good, bad, and the ugly, let's start with the good. The offense played well. The offense even from the opening drive, had Georgia on their heels. The offense had a hell of a game plan. Sitting there watching that game in person, watching it from the press box, there was, there was receivers open downfield. Uh, there was timing in their routes. Uh, there was explosive plays. I mean, we know now that the quarterbacks combined to set an SEC championship game record with 502 yards passing. Against a very stingy defense, they... Gave up to LSU 502 yards through the air. Yards per pass, 9.7. This was not a situation where you were dinking and dunking and guys were making heroic plays and they were making 73 guys miss and scoring. Now, there was some of that, but one of the most, to me, impressive stats from this game, if you're looking at the LSU offense, average depth of target was 14 yards. 14 yards, that's a big number. To compare that, Georgia was six and a half yards. Air yards, as far as balls in the air, caught no run after the catch, no yards after cut, none of that. 366 for LSU, 134 for Georgia. Average air yards per completion, 11.8 for LSU, only 5.8 for Georgia. This team made dynamic plays on the offensive side of the ball. I thought both quarterbacks had their moments. I thought Jaden Daniels tried to stay in there as long as he could. I thought he showed real toughness because we'll get to the bad part of it, but pressure's allowed 26 by LSU. 26. That's a lot of pressure. But the quarterbacks, I thought, played really well in this game. I thought they stood in the pocket. I thought they bought extra time with their legs when they had those pressures. And you had Garrett Nussmeyer go 15 of 27. 294, two touchdowns, and an interception. QBR over 90 against Georgia. Jaden Daniels, 16 of 24, 208. He had a touchdown, then he had the one interception that bounced four times before it ended up in a Georgia defender's arms. The freak interception bounced off a helmet. That's your turnover there. 73.4 QBR. But I thought both had moments. I thought both played well. And to see Nussmeyer get in there and have the confidence, like we, we've always tabbed him as the gunslinger. I think you saw that in this game. Look, the interception, even one of the touchdowns, made you hold your breath a little bit. But he is a playmaker, and he certainly made plays against a good defense. In the run game, you didn't really feel like you were going to have a ton of success, but you did see Josh Williams break off that 47-yarder. So a lot of explosive plays for LSU, certainly in the passing game. That was a positive. Those things were good. Those things were very good to see. There was a couple of moments the offensive line had moments, but they didn't have enough. And we'll get to that when we get to the bad portion of this. If we're going good as well, I know defensively is going to end in the bad category because of what you gave up. Harold Perkins did have 10 tackles. He had eight solos and a tackle and a half for loss, but it wasn't enough. And I thought Major Burns had a pretty good game as well. But the defense, they gave up six explosive runs to Georgia. You only had one. You had the Josh Williams. Explosive runs, six to UGA. That's coming off what happened against Texas A&M. So the defensive side of this, that portion of it, obviously was the bad. 
when you look at the team stats. Because total yards, 549 against Georgia. The offense is always going to fall in that good category. The defense, though, they gave up 529 yards. 274 through the air. They gave up 255 on the ground. That's almost as balanced as you possibly can be. Todd Munkin, he did put on a little bit of a clinic. And it was through the runs. 44 rushing attempts for Georgia that were back. They were just back crushers, right? 5.8 yards per rush for Georgia, only 2.4 for LSU. So that's two weeks in a row you've played a physical running opponent and they've been able to lean on you. They've been the one that have been able to get the extra yards. And it's been a lot of gap integrity a week ago. There was a little bit more push. Like we'll see the numbers before contact. That usually comes on Monday afternoon. You get the exact number of yards per contact. Because last week we told you, you averaged 1.7 yards before contact. a and actually had 1.5 yards before contact. So it wasn't a push issue last week. It was more gap integrity and you couldn't get A-chain on the ground. This week you gave up too much on the ground. And that certainly was part of the bat. And again, like we'll get down into this. We're going to break down the Brian Kelly sound to go along with some of these plays and moments that we're talking about. We're giving you the good, the bad, the ugly here in segment number one. Also the bad, I mentioned it a second ago, total pressures allowed. You gave up 26 pressures. Georgia only gave up nine. You gave up four sacks. You did not get Stetson Bennett on the ground. You had zero sacks, right? So that adds to your guys getting pressured, your guys having to get off the spot. Now they did, and they made a lot of plays getting off their their mark and finding a receiver down the field, and they had a lot of success doing that. But your guy was on the ground also four times. Not not totally surprising. Georgia's got a really good unit. They were more pressures than sacks, more hurries than sacks coming into this game. That was something I talked about all weekend long on every platform I was on, and they did. They had 26 of them. They got your guy on the ground four times. You could not get Stetson Bennett on the ground. That was another part of the bad. The ugly, you probably already guessed it yet again, the LSU special teams. Look, I'm someone who is prideful in special teams. I'm someone who played it all four years here at LSU, regardless of what I was doing on offense. Certainly in the NFL, being a fullback, you got to do special teams. You got to be a core guy. So you try to pride yourself in that because it is a phase of the game. And yet again, the LSU special teams had a play, the play, the moment, whatever you want to call it. Your offense gets the ball, drives it down the field on one of, if not the best defense in the country. And I'll be honest with you, didn't make it look very difficult either. Put together a really nice drive. It stalled at the end towards the goal line there. You're going to get points. because. The good portion of your special teams has been actually the guys that kicked the football. Field goals, punts, they've actually done a really nice job this year. But yet again, because we're not even like we're not talking about like what led to it. You got another kick blocked. Another one. Right? We know what happened in the first game of the year. You get a field goal block, you get an extra point block, you lose the game, you muff two punts, and we'll get to that po- portion of it later. You get yet again another kicked block. Okay, you should have, if, if, if at all, you should have one of these in a season and it's because one guy maybe had a heroic effort or your guy had one mistake, whatever it might be. You've had so many this year, okay? You have it and then you don't understand the rules and then you don't go and make sure that the ball is dead. Now, did Georgia players know that it was dead? Nah, they weren't real sure. I mean, you had the Todd Monk, and they showed him in the press box. I mean, he's waving, get away from it, get away from it. The ball's live. There was not a whistle. The ball is live. And he picks it up, and he goes 90-plus yards to the house, and it's a 10-point swing. You cannot have a 10-point swing against the best team in the country. You worked to get down there, right? You're going to score points because – you stop their defense three and out, or their offense, sorry, excuse me, three and out, okay? And then you do that. So that's a backbreaker. You're about to go up 3 nothing. You got some momentum. Your defense just got them off the field. And then you give them seven points. Can't happen. Should never happen. But certainly, time and time again, you're having kicks that are blocked. 
It has to be an issue that shows up once a year, if any, but certainly not this many times. And it's not only that, it's when you look at the return game, and I'll credit my guy Hanny because we were talking about this on the way home. I got a great Hanny story, by the way, about the airport. We'll get to that. We're having a conversation, and Hanny made a great point. He said, give me the dynamic play in special teams this year. And this is a group of us. I mean, Scone's sitting right there. I'm sitting right there. Multiple people that cover the sport sitting right there. I didn't have one for you. I mean, Ramos making the field goal against Florida, that was, that was a pretty big one. Put the game away. Probably be my leading candidate. But how many ones that didn't go your way popped to mind? How many muff kicks did you have? And it became a point where you, you had so many that then it became just a non-factor in what you do. LSU this year had a total of 40 punt return yards for the season. 40. 4-0. Four for the entire season, LSU had 40 punt return yards. They averaged 2.7 yards per return. Their opponents averaged over 10 yards per return. 2.7 to 10.3. That's the difference. I realize that punt returns are different now than they were when I played. Everybody, and this became uh, my junior, senior year, everyone started to go to the spread punt, but you're still trying to figure it out a little bit. But you had returns. But you became a team because you had three or four muff punts that you became a team that wasn't worried about any fear of returning the football. You just worried about catching it. The game after all that happened, okay, I understand it. Everybody in Tiger Stadium, Mississippi State, you catch a punt, everyone cheers, right? Laughing about it because you had problems fielding punts. But we, you just have no threat back there. Kick returns, now they go out of the back of the end zone. I, I also understand that. Even though when you returned it, it was less than 20 yards. It was 19.7 on kick returns as well. But to only have 40 yards, 2.7 per return, and the other team is over 10 it's a problem. It's an issue, right? Now, special teams penalties, those were also an issue. Those pop up. They do. They pop up. I understand that. Blocking the back, holding on returns. You're going to see that on almost every team. But obviously, the volume of them on this team seemed like they were high. We know the game, opening kickoff, you're off sides on the opening kickoff. So that, that to me, that was a, a changing moment. And I know the game ended up being 50 to 30. I understand that. But if you were in the building, you felt the momentum LSU had, everyone in the press box kind of looking around a little bit, looking at each other, saying, okay, this LSU offense is going to have some success today. Would the defense have done what they did after that? We don't know that. Maybe so. In fact, probably so. But it was such a big moment in that game, it took all the air out of the building on one sideline. And by the way, that building was 90-10. It was 90% UGA fans. And we can get to that later. And I understand the challenges of it. Trust me, we'll have that conversation but it was just a back-breaking moment in that game, something we'll certainly talk about. I know we're going long here in the first segment. We'll do this. We'll take a break. We've got sound from Coach Brian Kelly because the one thing I can tell you about what happened on Saturday as an alum that I kind of viewed, I'm proud as hell of the way the team fought. I can tell you that. I am proud of the effort. That team had no quit in them. And make no mistake about it, UGA and Kirby Smart going for two, making it 50 they wanted every piece of that game. There was no pulling off. And this young LSU football team fought like hell until the clock hit triple zero. And the coaching staff should be proud. Everyone in that building should be proud of the effort. There was a lot of good there. The special teams portion of it, obviously close to me. I get frustrated by that. And we're going to have those conversations. But it was not an effort issue. The effort by the purple and gold there in Atlanta on Saturday was certainly there. All right, we'll take that break. When we come back, you'll hear from Brian Kelly after the game. It is OTB. All right, I know we don't play a ton of audio on this show, but I think it is important because I thought Brian Kelly did a fantastic job of kind of laying out what it took to get there, what the season was like, what their expectations are moving forward, and also a couple of moments in that game. Certainly the block field goal that we talked about a lot there last segment, we can get to but here is brian kelly just in the loss to uga in the sec championship game in its totality i mean you're, you're talking about five or six plays where you know look coulda woulda shoulda right the best team won today um but 
uh, I love the way our guys competed. They fought, um, and and that's who they are. That's the identity of this team all year. Uh, and unfortunately, we were not clean enough in some of those areas uh, against uh, the number one team in the country. And when you're playing the best team in the country for an SEC championship, those things are going to come back and affect the outcome. Handful of plays, and I think he's right. I think we can all point to a majority of those plays. We've talked about the field goal. We've talked about maybe some of the turnovers, the one that bounces off Besh's helmet, ends up in a UGA defender's arms. That obviously was a game-changing moment. Uh, the fourth and one. Was the game in doubt for Georgia? Probably not, but it was a big play in the game. Fourth and one, you're on the five. You got some momentum, and you got some real momentum. And, look, we've seen crazier things happen in college football and running out of shotgun at that time. Look, and I know that's what college football is. Obviously, like for me, not a huge fan of it. And, you know, you run at one of the best defenders in the country. He makes a play. You're not able to get there. And you feel like you had an opportunity to punch one in. So those are some of the plays that he's talking about. Um, 50 to 30. Again, not the score that I had on the bingo card. That's the way that it played out. But again, I do want to point out because, yeah, sometimes when you lose, obviously, like we're going to talk about why you lost the game. And the next answer, that's what we're going to hear, one of the plays of the game. But the fight was there. That was encouraging to see LSU's fight. And they fought until the very, very end of that game. And it's not as far off as I even thought going into that building. But obviously on the block field goal play, that's certainly one that we want to play some sound from the LSU head coach. Obviously, uh, we did a poor job coaching. Um you know, it's our responsibility to have our guys alert in that situation. Um, they were not alert, and, and that falls on coaching, and that falls on my shoulders, and um, I take full responsibility for that. It was a play. There was confusion. There was from both sides. I mean, there was players not really knowing what to do outside of one Georgia player that kind of knew what was going on. He stood over the ball and is looking at the referee and, seeing what the referee was going to say or do, maybe what one of his teammates was going to say or what they were going to do. And once the referee sat there, and he, when you don't have the referee going over top of the ball or blowing his whistle, you know it's a live football. So he picks it up and he goes 90-plus yards. It was great awareness by their team. I mean, some of their coaches didn't know that was a live ball. Again, they showed Todd Munkin later, and he's saying, get away, get away, get away, when no, it is in fact a live football. And those are some of the situations. Like, they didn't know. I mean, you got 33 dapping up. One of his players right there, and eventually they figure it out. But that is a you know sense of awareness. It's a play that might not happen again in any one of those players' careers. It might not happen again, but it's those little things. And LSU has been so good, and still been very good, on the little things for a majority of the season. Brian Kelly always talks about the traits that got them there. This is not a deep football team. It's got some talent. It's not a talentless football team. They have talent. The depth is not there. Georgia has depth, right? They've built that depth over time, over a seven-year period. We've talked about their depth. Not one player out of the transfer portal. The only team in the entire Power Five not to go digging in the portal and having to find players to patchwork a team together. A little duct tape, a little super glue, and you got a team. And that's okay. It's okay to do that. Else you had to do that this year. And they did a really nice job. They hit on almost every single thing they did in the portal. It's the reason they were in that game on Saturday. You go get some defensive backs from the SEC in Arkansas, the Big 12 in Oklahoma State. Like We know the list of portal players you brought in. You know, you know, Georgia doesn't have to do that. They didn't have to go hunting in, in the portal because of that depth. And some of that depth started to show up a little bit in this game. When Georgia has a player go down, they put another one in. And they have a running back that... As a mistake, comes over, coach lets him know about that mistake. They send another guy. It's pretty much the same player right there in. And time and time again, you saw that. Receiver drops the ball. Oh, great, come sit down by me. Let's go put another guy in there. It's probably about the same talent as you are. The guy gets beat on a deep ball. Hey, you're coming to sit by me, right? We're going to coach you up. In fact, the run that Josh Williams had, the 47-yard run, Kirby pulled his linebackers off the field, put two new linebackers in there and was coaching both of them for about three plays after that. Puts them back in the game. They, they have that ability. They have depth. They have players that are basically on the same level, and I think that showed 
on Saturday, but LSU is not that far away. I really, I truly don't believe they're that far away from being a team that can compete in that game. If you played it 10 times, they're competing all 10 times. And here is Brian Kelly on what the goal is in the future for LSU football. It's 24-7. It's not just on the field. It's it's how we do things away from the building. It's it's every day in the classroom, in the community, all the little things that are going to allow us to be more aware and to be better communicators and have an attention to detail in all those areas. Um, we got to continue to develop our football team, but this – foundation is is really strong and uh, we'll be able to um, uh, continue to build on it um, but I don't believe that the gap is um, something that we can't uh, continue to close and um, get back here again next year that'll be our goal to get back here and to win it and I completely agree with him uh, the gap's not big before the season the gap was the Hoover Dam and now it's a thin margin it's not that big. You have done a really nice job of putting this roster together to compete for this year, to create momentum, to compete at a higher level next year. I truly believe that. And that's why I want to have Billy Embody on in about an hour from now. What's the word on LSU in recruiting? How's LSU being talked about in recruiting? Right? Is LSU cool again? Because LSU at times has been the coolest program that we've ever seen. Right? Everybody wanted to go play for LSU. What's the word in the recruiting streets right now about LSU? What can you do in the transfer portal? You're one of the portal. You did damn good. You patchworked a team together that was competitive almost every time they went out there. And the last time we saw them before you got here, we know what it was. It was 38, 39 scholarship players. We're all tired of hearing about it. You had a receiver, quarterback, we know. But that's what it was. And then you played in the SEC championship game. It is not that far for LSU to be back to a team that we know LSU. And I'm not talking about a one-off LSU team. I'm not talking about where you struggle for years, you have a good year in 18, you have maybe the best year we've ever seen in 19, and then it falls off again. I'm talking about 2001, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'm talking about that kind of run. I'm talking about a team that has sustained success over a long period of time, a program, not a great season, not a couple of years strung together. Now, those teams that got strung together, don't get me wrong, fantastic football teams. But LSU is a place where you can have a 10-year run of those kind of football teams, similar championship aspirations. One game here or there decides if you go to a championship or not. I think they're close to that. Truly believe that in my heart, that they're not that far away from that.